so as you know in a cmos circuit pretty much we are we are basically charging and discharging capacitors either you know your cmos gate essentially either pulls up the output node or, or the pull down stack connects the output to ground and every node in the circuit has capacitance basically the self capacitance of the gate due to source drain junctions the wiring capacitance the gate input capacitance of the the gates to which the output of the current gate is connected to so basically you have every node or every net is a capacitor and at some level if you see all you are doing is whenever you do computing in a cmos chip you are charging discharging capacitors basically of course with clever design of which capacitors charge and which discharge and so on that's really where the intelligence of the computing or the designer comes in but at at like a very gross level basically all you are doing is charging and discharging capacitors so so let's begin with you know understanding the charging and discharging of capacitors <coughs> from a power perspective how much power does it take or what is the energy cost to charge and discharge a capacitor so what we have here is a capacitor of capacitance value c okay initially its voltage is zero and it is charged through a resistor r from the power supply vdd so you can imagine that this resistance r is the pull up stack of your cmos gate it computes a pull up stack pull up pull up stack essentially is on so it charges the output node to vdd okay so this is the model we have so the output voltage in this kind of a simple model goes up exponentially towards vdd right if you wait long enough it will go to vdd so the instantaneous current out here flowing in the circuit is given by c db by dt the rate of change of voltage <coughs> across the capacitor <coughs> so the instantaneous power delivered to the capacitor is power delivered across any device is basically the voltage times the current through the device voltage across the terminals times the current flowing through those terminals so v times i is the power of the capacitor similarly the power delivered to the resistor is vdd minus vt because the voltage across the resistor is this vdd minus vt <coughs> v of time <coughs> times the current current is the same they are in series so this is the instantaneous power at any particular time if you measure this is the power what is the power delivered by the supply vdd times i okay <laughs> of course in this case if you look at the 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 polarity polarity is important the current is coming out of the positive terminal whereas here if you see the voltage is positive here negative here the current is going into the positive terminal of this device similarly the current is going into the positive terminal of this device when i say positive terminal what i mean is which terminal has higher voltage compared to the other terminal so in that case the sign of power is positive that means power is being delivered into those devices in the case of the supply voltage positive is up the current is coming out of it so actually the the power is negative minus vdd times i is the power delivered to the device that means power is coming out of the device so now the the thing is what is the energy to charge up the capacitor or what is the energy which is stored in the capacitor because when when you have power delivered to the capacitor really it gets stored the energy gets stored right whereas in the case of resistor the energy gets lost as heat so basically we want to calculate the energy stored in the capacitor and the energy is basically integral of power and power is rate of change of energy so that these two basic definitions you should keep in mind you should not confuse power and energy <coughs> so the energy delivered to the to a device is the integral of power all the way from big bang to current time okay and uh, of course in our case we have set it up where the voltage across the capacitor is zero before 
t equal to 0. So, we will just integrate from 0 to t. So, voltage across the capacitor times the current through the capacitor which is C dv by dt. Fortunately, this integral is very easy to solve because this dt, this dt goes away. So, it just becomes integral as a integral of v dv. Right? Integral v dv is v square by 2. So, the energy is half C v square at that particular time. At energy at stored in the capacitor at time t is half C v square where v is the voltage at that time. And so, if you wait long enough, let the capacitor fully charged to V dd, the energy stored in the capacitor is half C v square, C v dd square. What is the energy dissipated in the resistor? Again, <coughs> integrate the power, instantaneous power delivered to the resistor and we said the power was the voltage across the resistor which is VDD minus V times the current C dV by dT. Okay, so, we just push it in, distribute it. So, VDD times C dV and minus integral C V dV. So, this is at any time t is C V dD times V t is the this integral evaluates to that and then this integral evaluates to C V square by 2 just like before. So, at E at t equal to infinity if you wait long enough let the capacitor fully charge the current has come all the way down to ground sorry 0 the energy dissipated in the resistor as heat is half C V square. So, what is interesting is exactly half is stored in the capacitor, I mean half Cv square is stored and the same amount is dissipated in the resistor also. So, the other thing is it is independent of the value of the resistor no matter what resistor you use. You have the same energy which is stored in the capacitor and lost as heat in the resistor. So, natural question is what happens when the resistor is 0? <coughs> well, actually what happens is that at t equal to 0, you will have, you know, if you take a realistic, firstly is it possible for resistance to be 0 in a realistic so, condition? <coughs> okay. Actually, it is possible for resistance to be exactly equal to 0. If you use superconductors, it can happen. If, if you below the critical temperature, resistance will drop down to 0, DC resistance is 0. Now, suppose you had a superconductor, it was cooled down, you know, maybe the wires were niobium and you cooled it below liquid helium and uh, using liquid helium and it was all superconductor and you turn this circuit, you connect it, what will happen? Since you have taken the analog class now, you should be able to answer. Analog class, RF class. See, you will always have inductance. See, you can never avoid inductance. Just like capacitance, you can never avoid. You can never avoid inductance. There is always some inductance. Whenever you have current, magnetic field, self coupling, you have inductance. Self inductance will be there. So, what you essentially have is a LC circuit. You always have a LRC circuit. It just happens that L is so small most of the times, at least explicitly, unless you put an L we ignore it, but you really have an L. So, it is an LC circuit, you turn it on, what you will have is oscillation. So, you will have an LC oscillator. Okay. Now, of course, the oscillations can die down, even though there is no DC resistance, but you could have energy radiated out like an antenna. So, you could still have loss, that can happen. So, loss can happen either due to heat or due to loss due to radiation. So, that was just a small aside. You know, it's a popular question which is asked in quizzes and so on. But let me just deal with it right now. Okay, so you can do the integral, which is not that difficult, surprisingly, to calculate. But you can. There's another way to do this calculation for energy, which is very useful. Sometimes it's kind of better to do it this way. Uh, here, what you do is you look at the total charge 
which has been delivered by the power supply. The power supply does work of lifting the charge from minus to plus potential. It's kind of it's like potential energy. You are taking it up, the potential. So the work done by the battery is Q times VDD. Okay, the energy stored in the capacitor is half V V square. So, and Q is when it finally charges to V D D. Q is C V D D. So the work done by the battery is C V D D square. Half of it is stored. That means half is lost in the resistor. So this is again another way of calculating. Again, the same answer of what is the energy lost in the <coughs> resistor. So where is energy lost? We said it's lost as heat, and maybe some small amount as radiation, but largely as heat. The other interesting thing here is that, you know, there is no, if you look at this way of calculating, we don't care what R is, whether R is linear, does it depend on voltage, nothing matters, okay. We are just looking at the end points. It doesn't matter how complicated R is. R could be a function of the voltage across it, which is kind of, in some sense, what happens with transistors, right. The transistor, you know, Yes, in an idealized model, we have transistor as an ideal switch with a linear resistor, but in reality, if you see, it's not really a linear resistor. But if you lay, take this approach of calculation, you find that no matter what happened, detailed waveforms, at the end of the day, Q is the charge provided by the battery. It has done a work of VDD times Q. And if some energy is stored in the capacitor, remaining is lost. So this is a simple way of calculating energy consumptions. Now when you have a CMOS gate discharging an output node, you have a pull down stack which turns on and it connects the output node to the ground. So again the output node has, we lump all the capacitance of the output node into a single capacitor C, it had some initial voltage V and it discharges. So Again, there is, in the case of a simple RC network, the discharge has this exponential form and the energy lost is whatever is stored in the capacitor initially, it gets lost, right. So half CV square is the energy lost. Again, this energy is lost as basically heat through the resistor. And this heat is a very important problem. You see, it's becoming hot. This is what is happening. You see, the laptop is becoming hot. It's because of this. Energy is getting lost through all the various resistors here uh, and getting converted to heat. Pardon? As I said, the other way could be um, radiation. So especially, you know, uh, when you have specifically radio circuits, so I have a Wi-Fi here, it is connected to the ISC wireless LAN. So there is a radio which is radiating energy. So that is the, basically the other way in which energy gets transformed from chemical energy of the lithium ion battery to, uh, right. Now it turns out that uh, we can charge a capacitor, this is an aside, we can charge a capacitor to a voltage V without losing any energy in the heat. Okay, now I just said that no matter what resistance you put, energy loss is half CV square. That is when I have a fixed battery and I connect it. Okay. But suppose my battery itself was such that the voltage of the battery started off at V equal to 0 and slowly ramps up to V equal to V. Then of course the energy stored in the capacitor is at the end of the charging cycle is still the voltage is VDD, so half C VDD square is stored, nothing changes. But the energy lost in charging can be reduced quite a bit by reducing the rate at which I turn on the voltage. That is something we maybe we'll see in, in a later class in more detail. 
So let us look at now, uh, now that we understand the energy required to charge this as a capacitor, let us look at the simplest CMOS gate. So, you know, again, whatever happens in the case of an inverter, largely you can say also happens for any other CMOS gates. So we'll just keep everything simple and just look at the inverter. So in the case of a CMOS inverter, we have a PMOS and NMOS and I have shown two currents, IP and IN. This is the current coming, flowing through the PMOS, current flowing through the NMOS and some current flows through the capacitor to either charge or discharge. VI is the voltage input voltage, VO is the output voltage. So when the input which is the orange curve is switching the output switches correspondingly and uh, if you look at, if you plot the currents, so this is now as a function of time, okay. So we look at the currents, current profile, what we will find is that when VI is going low and the output is going high, basically I am charging up the capacitor. So I expect a large of, a lot of current to flow through the PMOS and that is what we see. And when I am discharging the output, <coughs> the current is flowing mainly through the NMOS and that is what we see, the NMOS curve. And, but we also see some small amount of current in the other device. So that means when I am charging up, there is some amount of current which kind of flows through straight. It kind of leaks out straight to ground. So that current is called a short circuit current because it is a current which is essentially kind of like a short circuit between the VDD and ground, also called crowbar current. Similarly, when I am charging up or when I, when I am discharging the output, I will have some amount of current flowing from the PMOS also. That is because, you know, when so let us take the case when I am charging uh, up the output, V0 goes from 0 to high, that means VI is which was high initially, NMOS was on, starts going low. So the PMOS starts turning on, NMOS starts turning off. But there is a period when both NMOS and PMOS are both on, small period de defined by the time of this edge, slew time. So in that period, you will have some current flowing straight. So that is a short circuit current. Now we will ignore the short circuit current for now and we will just focus on the current and the energy required to charge discharge the capacitor. Now the energy stored in the capacitor is half CV square, no matter whether there is short circuit current or not because it is just defined by the voltage of the capacitor. But if, they, if you did not have to worry about short circuit current, then you know, essentially the energy lost in the charging is half CV square, like we just calculated before. Similarly, for discharging, it is half CV square and this energy is lost in these transistors and come, comes out as heat. So in one cycle, where I go up and down, the total energy loss is sum of these two energy losses, CV square. So power is rate of loss of energy or rate of consumption of energy. So I lose CV square of energy in the time duration of T which is say 1 clock period and 1 by T is also F. So it is also written as either CV square by T or CV square F. This is the formula you might have seen. This is the power to <coughs> charge and discharge <coughs> a capacitor at a rate of F cycles per second. T is a period of one cycle, which is 1 by F. Now, the probability of switching, right, it is not that every node will switch from 0 to 1. When you do computation, for example, if it is an AND gate, only when both the inputs go from 0 to 1 will the output also go from 0 to 1. Otherwise, for other things, it will not change. So, in every any cycle, the only node which you are guaranteed you know that it will change is the clock node. The clock is a periodic signal. Every cycle there is one up transition, one down transition in the clock. Every other node we do not know. It really depends on what you are computing. Typically, the so that is that is captured by this term called switching probability. Here we are just using the symbol alpha. So if alpha is the probability of switching from 0 to 1, then the power consumed is just given as alpha cv square. 
Okay, now alpha is equal to 1 for the clock. For other nodes, it turns out for data nodes, any other node in the circuit, the switching probability is pretty small, maybe 1 percent or less. Okay, that means in 100 cycles, one cycle the data node will switch. So, the switching probability is pretty small. But the way it is accounted is yes, you have power loss, but power is not drawn from the battery. But whatever is stored in the capacitor is lost as heat. Only when you go from 0 to 1, you draw power from the battery. Okay. So, you can either say alpha half Cv square F and then, but then you have to adjust alpha accordingly that is alpha could be number of times a node switches, whether 0 to 1, 1 to 0, I do not care. In the case of clock, then alpha is 2 for that formula. Actually, alpha will power. Like we will add these two powers. Huh. So, it alpha, it will come no, no, it is not like that. Alpha is the probability of switching. It is not 1 minus alpha. Uh -huh. Alpha Half Cv square is the loss every time it switches. If it switches, it is half Cv square. If it does not switch, there is no right. So, the question is what is the when you do power estimation what is the value of alpha you would choose ok. So, the, how do we do power estimation you have to basically um, so, so basically you have to estimate alpha because there can be a lot of difference alpha of 0 0.01 as I said 1 percent versus 100 there is a 100 to 1 difference right. So, really the key problem turns out to be one of the key problems is to estimate alpha reasonably accurate when you do power estimation. Now, if you did not have any other information, you can just go by historical empirical evidence, people report ok, this is the kind of switching activity, you just use that 1 percent, 2 percent, you know 5 percent, maybe conservative you say 10 percent, but it is not 1, 1 is just really going overboard ok. 1 happens when depending on the kind of circuits you use, there are certain circuit styles where no matter what the data value is, you will have a, some switching activity. But for normal CMOS circuits, the value is less. So, the first back of the envelope calculation, you will just use some alpha, some reasonable alpha. And then, if once you have the circuit, you actually run simulations in the circuit, just functional simulation, logic simulation, and you can get the activity <coughs> factor. From there, you say this is the average activity factor, and then you use that. How do you get the activity factor? You just count every node in the every variable you just see or uh, so, so many mil in the million cycles of simulation how many times it switched from 0 to 1 that divided by million is the activity factor for that node and you find the average for all the nodes or you can do power per node you know so then it is sigma alpha i c i v square f where c i is the capacitance of node i alpha is the switching probability of node i. So, as we just discussed there is a short circuit current which flows because momentarily during the transition of the input both transistors are on one is going from off to on other is going from on to off and during that time there will be what is called a through current short circuit current crowbar current you know different terms are used this amount of current really depends on the slope if you are imagine that you have a very slow rise time that means the input is going from 0 to 1, it is taking a long time to go. What that means is that for a long duration of time, both the NMOS and PMOS will be on. So, the short circuit current will flow for a longer duration of time when the edge rates are poor. Now, typically when you design as you said, you, you know, so you want to avoid such very slow edge rates okay, because of this problem that you, you can have a lot of short circuit current. So, you kind of have want to have reasonably fast edge rates and uh, when you do the sizing which we said fan out force sizing and so on the kind of edge rates you get under those kinds of edge rates the short circuit power turns out to be not more than 10 percent of the overall dynamic power less than 10 percent. So, typically short circuit power is in a well designed system will not be more than 10 percent. If you want to get the exact value for the short circuit current 
and the short circuit power. What is short circuit power? It is instantaneous power is I short circuit current times VDD, right? And the short circuit energy is you have to integrate that. Now this current really depends on the actual voltage waveform, time waveform, and so on. So it can become quite complicated to actually calculate. There is no simple analytical expression. But fortunately, as I said, this number is a small number. So you can just you do your CV square F estimate and then you add another 10 percent you say that is my power and remember this power is a power which is associated <coughs> with the dynamic it's we can club it with the dynamic power why what is dynamic power is the power when things are changing dynamism means change when you are charging discharging that is the power so only during then we have the <coughs> uh, dynamic power as well as the short circuit power maybe I should include brackets around cv square f plus psc because alpha is you know if there is no switching there is no short circuit i should have you know put brackets around this and this now how do we reduce this dynamic power <coughs> excuse me so just to get a feel give you a feel for this power right the power maybe in a laptop like this of the processor will be about 10 watts limit power dissipation in a um, high-end server computer right you know, which is running your heavy duty computing and so on in the cloud that would be about 100 watts so these are typically the power numbers maybe the power in a cell phone processor cell phone chip would be about 2 watts so these are the various levels you know maybe 1 10 100 you can say these are the levels of power dissipation and uh, what is the practical as issue with power essentially it's to do with heat because finally when power is consumed it gets converted as heat and it's heating up right if it heats up too much you can melt the circuit <coughs> I mean it can heat you know if you don't take specific precautions you can really damage the circuit so yeah, functionality can change and can just stop working. So, you have to, the, really the problem is to take out heat. That is the key challenge when you design these systems. One of the key challenges is to take out heat because when you do computing, you generate heat. right so right so that is the next task is basically how do i reduce power uh, because why we want to reduce power we want to reduce power because we can essentially simplify the design of the system uh, the cooling requirements and so on i can have a simple maybe i don't have to do anything for cooling just the ambient air will cool it here if you see there is a fan which is on which is <coughs> turning on and pushing pulling in cool air from outside and so on uh, some of these uh, computers you also have more elaborate cooling you'll have chilled water coming in and cooling it and so on so you might have to do things like that and some of the supercomputers they also use like liquid nitrogen to cool it so you'll have to and also cooling it keeping it at low temperature helps to make things run fast for high performance right remember for high performance if you recall VDD is high when you cool it Mobility is higher, right? So things go faster. So, you know, so it's kind of important to try to reduce power dissipation, right? And how do we reduce power? You just look at these equations. As I said, PSC is not something we usually worry about because it's a small fraction. What you do is you reduce the switching activity. You just look at this equation. You have to reduce all the terms. Reduce switching activity, <coughs> reduce switching capacitance, reduce the supply voltage, reduce frequencies. Any of these things will help you to reduce power. So the whole field of low power essentially looks at various ways to try to reduce all these different factors. Some of these would be done using circuit techniques. Some of these would be done at a higher level, architectural or algorithmic level, where maybe you reach, change your algorithm in a way where less number of things are switching. So some of these we will probably look in the following classes. 
one thing I wanted to just point out is the distinction between power and energy. Again, I want to reiterate, we know defin from a definition perspective that power and energy are not the same. Power is the rate of consumption of energy. Right? Now, you some people, sometimes we say I reduce power, sometimes I say I reduce energy. You know, are they the same? Are they different? Which is important? You know, what do you do? I'm confused. <laughs> okay, so if you see, if you reduce energy, you'll reduce power. Because energy, just go back to the CV square formula. CV square is the energy. You reduce that, rate of consumption of energy will also go down. So, power will also go down. So, any technique which will help you reduce energy is a kind of a more fundamental thing. You can also attack the power problem. Now, when you reduce power, it doesn't mean you'll reduce energy. For example, if I reduce power by reducing the frequency of operation, power is CV square F. If I reduce F, I reduce power. <coughs> but per operation, I am still charging and discharging that capacitor by VDD. I am still consuming an energy of CV square per operation. I am not changing that. So, the energy, if, I, if you know that you have to do so many number of operations, then the energy consumption of the, will not be, for doing that task will not change depending on how fast or how slow you run to a first order, but it will change when you talk about leakage, but for this discussion, basically power change, slowing it down does not reduce energy, just, just, just by slowing it down. Now, which is, you know, when do you worry about power, when do you worry about energy? So, if I have a device which is connected to the wall, what do I mean connected to the wall? You have 230 volts, 50 hertz AC <coughs> coming in, so in ideal conditions, Okay, maybe you have diesel generator, etc. So you don't worry about the power coming from the wall, right? So you know you don't you know what you are concerned about is making sure the system doesn't heat up. So in those consider thermal considerations drive power. Looking at power, how do I keep power low so that thermal design of the system becomes <coughs> easier, cheaper, lower cost. In this situation when I am running from the battery or your cell phone, clearly battery energy is important because the battery has certain amount of chemical energy and you would like to do as much work as possible using that limited chemical energy, as many operations as possible. So, energy per operation you want to reduce so that you can do more things. So, energy is important for battery applications. So, let us look at this one specific uh, approach. You know, we will come back and look at other ways of reducing power, but let us look at this approach of reducing the supply voltage VDD to reduce power. So, and reduce energy of course. So, energy is alpha CV square and power is alpha CV square F. Now, one thing is that, you know, when I reduce the supply voltage, my speed of operation will change. The max speed, I won't be able to go as fast as I could before. Why? Because the drive currents change. Drive current is given by the gate overdrive. VDD minus VTH is kind of setting my drive current. So, the delay, if I were to take the delay of any particular gate, I can kind of model it this way. The charge, delay is charged by current. Charge is CVDD. Current is proportional to VDD minus VTH to alpha. Here, alpha is not the activity factor but related to <coughs> velocity saturation, right? some factor alpha between 1 to 2, okay, it is not the activity factor, k is some proportionality constant, okay, this is a simple formula, okay, this formula works reasonably well, but it is not completely accurate, but it is kind of good for these kinds of analysis. So, frequency is, is inversion of T k dash VDD minus VTS to alpha by C V D. So, now when I reduce my supply voltage VDD, Okay, this alpha and this alpha is different, unfortunately I use the same, but this is the activity factor. Energy scales down as quadratically, okay, because CV square, I am plotting energy versus VDD. Power, suppose I were to plot power versus frequency. If I were to reduce frequency without changing the voltage, then power will scale down linearly, because CV square F, everything else is constant, F is P is a linear function of that. But if I say I am going to reduce frequency of operation, 
then you can ask the question if I am going to run slower why not use a lower supply voltage why because I know that you know there is a relationship between F and VDD if I am going to run F lower the F I will lower the VDD when you do that power reduces more than linearly ok so this is a very efficient way of reducing power as well as of course energy is to do voltage scaling so that is now something which is adopted in all the modern digital chips microprocessors and so on when they know that you don't have to run that fast you reduce the clock but then since you know that you are now running at a slower speed you also reduce the supply voltage so there will be a voltage regulator programmable voltage regulator which gets controlled by the system to output different levels of voltages so you can really optimize the power consumption and the energy consumption this is also called dynamic voltage scaling so dynamically when this happens for example now the system the laptop is not doing any computation so the clock speed can be reduced quite a bit it does not need to really run fast so then it will also reduce the voltage make the thing run slower so will anything be done to cater the noise to reduce the voltage so the question is uh, is there will there be a problem with noise when you are basically mucking around with the supply voltage yes so you have to be careful in how you do it and uh, one of the things is you know of course you are kind of limited by it turns out the time constants of the power supplies the power supplies are not very fast they will be in the milliseconds range and uh, so the voltages will change kind of slowly anyway but on top of it you want to make sure that whatever voltage you use at that voltage things will work properly at that speed <coughs> so you have to there are certain ways by which you have to uh, ensure that you also do not want to reduce the voltage so much that you lose information information stored in your memory should not be lost so that is another thing which has to be kept in mind so keeping all of that those things here essentially you have to engineer this and that is what is done how do we so the question is ok now I reduce the voltage of my chip but my chip is talking to another chip outside which has a standard voltage how do I do it so what is done is actually the interface circuitry in the chip which talks to outside world the voltages of those are usually not changed so they are they remain fixed the voltage only inside the core of the chip <coughs> is changed but you still have the problem of going from the core to the interface so you will have special level translator circuits which will translate the voltage levels from between the two sides you can have both discrete and continuous level practical implementations commercial implementations will use discrete levels you know they will say ok voltage will be 0.8 you know 0.91 or some such some small number of levels uh, you know because as I said there is a problem of ensuring that whatever voltage you use at that <laughs> voltage the fre frequency you know the chip will run at that frequency so that means you, you have to really analyze now that chip will run at so many different voltages when you introduce this concept of dynamic voltage scaling you have to really ensure that chip will run properly at all these different voltages so to keep that analysis small you would say okay let me just make it run at a few discrete steps and then for each of those voltage levels you ensure the corresponding frequencies can be met for all under all conditions but you can also have continuous um, so that is not kind of that widely used but definitely in a research setting it is something which has been tried out and shown to work so there is a interesting question as to how low a voltage can you use what is your guess what will de determine that voltage so that is a common answer that the threshold voltage will determine the the 
the minimum voltage of operation. Threshold voltage is usually 250, 350 millivolts and so it will de determine that. But it turns out that you can operate a digital CMOS gate all the way down to 100 millivolts. It's been shown. You can make it run at 100 millivolts, way below the threshold voltage. Threshold voltage is still 300, 350, whatever it was, but it was shown that you can actually operate it down to 100 millivolts. Now let us see how, what is the limit? What is the lowest voltage we can go down to? The reason I want to cover this is that because you know it's kind of an interesting application of this DC transfer curve. Okay? We studied this DC transfer curve in the uh, one of the earlier classes. So you know what a DC transfer curve is. Basically you have a voltage input on the x-axis, voltage output on the y-axis and then you get this curve. <coughs> now one of the, as you scale the supply voltage, what happens is that this whole curve shifts down because what was VDD here, now we are saying VDD is reduced. So you are taking this curve and squishing it down. <coughs> of course the shape of the curve changes a little bit. Really what is important as we said, if you recall again from this DC transfer curve lectures, is that the gain of this curve has to be at some points bigger than 1, the magnitude of the gain. That is when you have this function of restoring logic, when you can have proper noise margins and so on. So the way to then answer this question, what is the minimum supply voltage of operation is basically to kind of see at what supply voltage will the DC transfer curves gain becomes less than 1. So if you had an analytical formula for that, then you can basically get that get that answer. So let us look at that. Now as I said, the value at that voltage, the, the, the voltages, uh, the minimum voltages are very low, small voltages that we know. So these are voltages at which the transistors are now operating in the sub-threshold regime. They are not in the standard linear saturation and so on. We have to really look at the sub-threshold current equations to get an, get to the answer of this. So what is the sub-threshold current equation? We have the current of the transistor in the sub-threshold is given by, of course you have the gate overdrive which appears exponentially, E to the VGS minus VT divided by NVT. This N is the body effect factor which is between 1 to 2. This VT, small VT is the thermal voltage, KT by Q 25.6 millivolts times 1 minus e to the minus Vds by Vt. So if that is the equation, sub-threshold equation current, W by L is there and there is some constant out here, we will not worry about the constant but mobility, oxide, etc, etc comes in there. And uh, if you look at this Vds by Vt, one thing I wanted to point out, point out was that when Vds is about 3 or 4 Vt, that is 100 millivolts, e to the minus, this becomes e to the minus 4 becomes a very small number, so you can ignore it. So typically for VDS above 100 millivolts, you can kind of ignore this term. Now let us come back to this equation. Uh, you know that in the DC transfer curve analysis, the current, there is a certain DC input voltage, there is a certain DC output voltage. The current should be the same in both PMOS and NMOS. IP equal to IN, right? Because VO, VO is stationary. So we we will equate IP to IN, we will simplify our life, we will say this I0, W, L, VT, this is threshold voltage is the same for both NMOS and PMOS. So they are identical, NMOS and PMOS are identical. Then we will just equate these two currents. So you have, let us look at the current for the PMOS. This I0, W by L, I have just taken it out because it is the same for both, I have cancelled it out. So VGS for the PMOS is VDD minus VI, right, this is the VGS minus the threshold voltage of the PMOS, Vt divided by NVT, that is this first term. The second term is 1 minus E to the Vds by Vt. What is Vds? Is Vdd minus V0, that is Vds. So E to the minus Vdd minus V0 by the thermal voltage. So this is the equation for current for the PMOS. Similarly, the equation for current for the NMOS is E to the Vgs minus Vt. Vgs in the case of PMOS is this is Vi, so Vi comes in minus Vt threshold by NVT times Vd, 1 minus E to the minus Vds, Vds is V0 by Vt, okay. 
so these are the this is the equation now how do we go forward from here what we really need is this gain out here and at what value of voltage we'll calculate the gain we'll calculate the gain at the 45 degree line when the 45 degree line intersects this there we'll calculate the gain so that value is at that at that point vi is equal to vo is equal to vdd by 2 okay at that point if i calculate the gain and see when that gain falls below 1 then i'll have the value for the supply minimum supply voltage so now it's all algebra you know just moving things around uh, just one trick the other trick I want to mention here is so what I have done is I have just the minus vi I have taken it from here to this side so everything right so here is what we have now to calculate the gain I take the differentials so I have e to the vdd by nvt times I differentiate this with so I have e to the minus vdd by vt e to the v naught by vt times 1 by vt derivative of this times delta v naught that is equal to I do the same thing on this side Okay, I will not go through this detailed derivation, you can just look at it and see if it is okay or not. And when I have this, now what I do is I say let me calculate the gain for Vi is equal to V0 equal to Vdd by 2. I will just say V by 2 just to simplify the notation. And when we do that and we simplify, I get this term. The gain minus of delta v naught by delta vi because gain is negative it's a cmos uh, invert in, inverting gate i put in a minus so this is the positive term so i want this term 1 minus e to the minus v by 2 vt by n times e to the minus v by 2 vt should be bigger than 1 i want the gain to be bigger than 1 so you just simplify this this denominator comes here 1 minus e to the minus v by 2 vt should be bigger than this and then you simplify this comes this side so 1 should be bigger than n plus 1 e to the minus vt bring it this side e to the v by 2 vt bigger than n plus 1 so now I take the log v should be bigger than 2 vt log n plus 1 2 times 25.6 times log 2.5 it's about 47 millivolts so what this is saying is that just from this simple analysis just looking at this thermal consideration of gain being greater than 1 the supply voltage has to be at least 48 millivolts and you see it's independent of technology we have not used channel line nothing mobility nothing it just doesn't matter no matter what technology you have you should be able to <coughs> operate the circuitry down to 47 millivolts this is kind of like one kind of fundamental limit in some sense below 48 millivolts it will not work now it this was something which was uh, pointed out probably in 70s and uh, after that there were some attempts to try to make chips work down to these low voltages and people were able to successfully show at least in the laboratory chips working down to 100 millivolts it was good curious you know curiosity fine you know, so what now of course what happens when you run it at such low voltages speed, speed is really slow because your currents are so small it takes a, the capacitance has not changed it's the same capacitance right of course your voltage has come down but your speed really degrades cv by i i is degrading exponentially right i is a sub threshold equation so it was not very interesting but people were still using it for certain applications like watches and so on where you don't really need hell at high speed so watch electronics use sub threshold operation but off late with advanced technologies it turns out that even with a few hundred millivolts 200 300 millivolts which is sub threshold operation you can still operate in the megahertz range 16 megahertz 30 megahertz and so on and it's going to become even more and more with scaling of technology we'll find actually even sub threshold chips will be operating in the high megahertz range which opens up a lot of interesting applications where you will now be operating circuitry in the sub threshold regime where the supply voltage is less than the threshold voltage. So before I close are there any questions? <coughs> Is it based on 
So the question is, what are the different power modes in the microcontroller and systems, right? So there are two things. One is you saw to reduce power, you reduce activity. <coughs> okay. The other thing is, of course, reduce the supply voltage. Activity you reduce by shutting off things. When you shut off things, for example, if you just shut off the clock to a particular block, there will be no activity in that block. Alpha is zero in that block, so there is no dynamic power in that block. So, the power modes can be at different categories. You can have power modes where some modes you are just shutting off different things in terms of shutting off the clock to those things. And then the next step could be maybe remove the, disconnect the power supply from that. So, usually the power modes are one of these two things. Disable the clock and then extreme power down will be disable the power supply itself. Because we will see in the next class, another very important component of power is the leakage power. Dynamic voltage scaling, no. Typically, the power down modes, the dynamic voltage scaling is not uh, put in, in, especially in all these low end microcontrols and so on. So, only in this high end microprocessors is where largely they are doing dynamic voltage scaling. And yes, so that is also part of the power control feature, power down modes, but that is more of an advanced feature which is. Uh, you know, typically it is not available in the low end microcontrollers. Yeah. Okay, so the question is uh, I have shown it here also a little bit. <coughs> the question was when the inverter is, let us say the inverter input is going from 0 to high. Okay, the output goes up a little bit in the beginning and then it comes down. Okay, when you do the simulation, you will see that and that is basically because of this Miller capacitance. So, let us say initially voltage V, voltage input is 0, okay, the output is high and this NMOS is off. As the input starts going up, you see there is some coupling capacitance between the input to output. The PMOS is on. But as this starts charging up, imagine that the PMOS was not there at all. Then this is just like a standard, you know, you have two capacitors, one side goes up, the other side will start going up and the voltage will be based, the voltage you get will be based on the division ratio of the two capacitors. But here of course as it starts going up, this PMOS kicks in and it takes up this charge and the charge goes back to the supply. So that is what is happening and then after some time the NMOS turns on and then it pulls it down. So, for a brief period, you have what is called bootstrapping. It is getting bootstrapped to a voltage above the power supply.